It was a very emotional ending, actually, to the film. I don't know if anyone else felt emotional. Um, so thank you, Jessica Berman thank Bogdan. You. I hope you all liked it. Yes, for joining us. Um, I thought before we get into discussion of the film itself and the process, uh, Jessica, if you could tell us a little bit about what it means to be an archival producer uh, and visual research and what that actual work entails. For me, it's a very creative process. Um, it's the hunter and gatherers. Um, it's always different. It's always um, a new search, a new journey. Um, you're the eyes and ears for the director and the producers. Um, and what you find, especially if it's an archival film such as this, which was 99% archived, um, what, you, what you actually get for the production becomes part of what's up on the screen. And it's a collaboration. Um, it's exciting. Um, and then you get, after you find it, you need to acquire it. And then you have to do the licensing. So as a producer, you're not just finding, you're also responsible for taking it to the end where you have to clear it, you have to go through the legal agreements, you have to help order the masters, you have a technical knowledge as well. Um, so it's all of that from the very beginning of concept to delivery at the very end. So it seems like a very all-encompassing role. It is. It's, it's, as I said, I was probably the first one right. to be hired and the last one and to the go. Last one. You know, um, I'm responsible for cataloging all of it. Um, I usually will do a database, um, which over the years I've sort of developed a database which helps to um, keep track of all the production and all the elements. There's a footage, there's a photo, there's an ephemera, there's an audio, there's a music database. And then all of that feeds into a post-production database, which is um, more of a rights and clearance. And you take the final elements and bring it into that database, and it helps us to follow all the different areas between the, the, the quality of the masters to the, the legal parts and the, and the payments and the delivery and all of that. And you founded a, your own company to help, help facilitate all of those yes. aspects, yes. yes. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit, I think probably the number one question when seeing it, is how was the footage discovered? Um, the promotional material around the film says National Geographic discovered this footage in their vaults. Right. Um, could you tell us about sure. that process and what state was the footage in? What does that mean? Um, when Hugo first shot something like 140 hours of film, um, it was in six, I think 1965. Was the f they were National Geographic made a film called Miss Goodall and the Wild Chimpanzees that Orson Welles actually narrated. It was very dry. It was very boring, but um, <laughs> but you know, like Jane looks left, Jane looks right. Um, <laughs> so the footage was some of the footage was cut into that, and then they used a little bit more in 1984 in another film that was done. And then the rest was just vaulted and hidden for all these years. Someone saw all these reels sitting there a few years ago, I think it was 2014, and um, brought it to the attention of um, the head of Nat Geo, and they said, well, let's do another film. And they, so when Brett got all the film, we, we brought it all in, um, we transferred it all to 2K, digitized everything, and when he started looking at it, it was like, oh my God. Whoever had done these films had cut it, but all the negative was just has haphazardly put back onto these reels. There was no rhyme or reason. There was no story. There was no continuity of shots. So They're basically, like outs and trims from that. It was that just outs and trims. Yeah. And he was like, "Oh my God, how am I going to do this?" So he he actually stopped production for about six months and reassembled. We there was a whole team trying to figure out how these shots were actually to be put together. And and he reconstructed the original shooting, pretty much. And then he set out to, to put all the elements together. Um, the Nat Geo was only one part of it. I was out getting all sorts of other footage. Um, you mentioned, I think we, look, we see some home movies as well. There's home movies from Jane. There was lots of... Um, footage that Hugo had shot that was, um, that his brother had, that was, um, there was some at the National uh, Institute of Sound and Vision in the Netherlands, because Hugo was from the Netherlands. 
There's stuff at The Hague. They, we got in touch with researchers from um, Gombe, some of the researchers that were there. So there was super eight, there were 16, there were negative, there were positives, there were reversal prints. There is all sorts of different levels of quality. Um, there was a little bit of television in there, the, the Jack Parr who came down to Gombe to interview her. So, um, yeah. So what was your role in terms of the interplay between the director and the editors? Obviously the editing of the film was essential and almost probably equal to in some ways to the direction. It mm -hmm. seems to, it was created during the editing process, obviously right. is what you're saying, uh, compiling all that info. So what is, how does it actually look in terms of post-production? Are you sitting in a room with the director and the editor and helping them source material or how, what, in how does your In this case not, <laughs> because um, Brett's in California and I'm on the East Coast of the state. So um, we sort of have a line, uh, and I'm actually working with the editor um, or the assistant editor almost on a daily basis. Um, they're squirreled away, hidden behind closed doors doing what they do, and their needs are then communicated um, to me. Uh, as they're editing, there are other things that come up and, that, and they need sort of scene setting or, s I mean, for, for this, we pretty much had most of it. It was the journey of getting the rest of it in, but it, it is a process. It's like a f three phases. It's the initial go out and find material, um, which prepares them to start editing, and then as you edit, things come up that come out. And the, the film seemed a little bookended as well in terms of when um, Jane makes the discovery that chimps use tools. We get the montage, like the science-y montage mm -hmm. <laughs> of the like volcanoes and molecules and like charts right. and stuff. So I'm assuming that's also, he must have given you some instructions, I guess. On um, well, Brett's process is get me everything. <laughs> everything. So um, there were all the scientific studies. Duke University, there's a Jane Goodall and part of a uh, research center at Duke, um, they had all of the charts. Um, there were her charts plus all these other um, charts from the various researchers from that period. We scanned them all. We planted somebody there. We hired a student and they scanned for days all of the charts. There were, I forget how many thousands of photographs we brought in, um, close to 10, I think. Um, and, and then um, all of that was, was texture. Um, and his process is he watches it all in chronology, in chronological time. So it all has to be assembled and then he sits and absorbs it all and then decides what he's gonna do with it. Might not use any of it, but it makes up the whole and makes it, informs him as a director of how he's, what the story is. I just have a super nerdy question, um, or not super nerdy, <laughs> but how does he actually catalog all of this? So he's watching everything. I'm assuming he's writing down like shot of trees, shot of David Graybeard. How did he actually capture and track this info so that he could go back and find that clip and actually integrate That's it into the- That's the job of good cataloging. Okay. It's the <laughs> job of a database. It's the job of an assistant editor mm. putting it in properly into an editing system. It's what we do in pre-production so that what goes in comes out effectively. That's part of the job. Right. So. Uh, so I was thinking a little bit in watching the film about the idea of constructing narratives. Um, so the film itself, we have several layers of sort of narrative building. Um, and even the, f the footage that Hugo has shot, he arrives, you know, months after Jane's discovery. Um, so in, that's the first narrative construction. So he's arriving and they're staging different scenes basically that he can send back to National mm -hmm. Geographic so that weren't captured um, in as they happened. Right. And then eventually obviously there would be footage he would capture as it unfolded. So that'd be the first time. And then the second time of course is 50 years later, Brett is reconstructing and retelling this narrative. Um, and then you mentioned to me that the footage was entirely silent. Yes. So then we have a whole sonic narrative yeah landscape that has been created in post-production. Um, so I was wondering if you talk a little bit about the efforts going into that. That's incredible to me that all of the sound, we're hearing all the chimp sounds, the birds, the water splashing, everything. All of it was so silent. Um, they did a little sound recording down there, but we had to get every piece of sound. Um, we actually discovered um, there is a company that um, 
that goes around the world and captures natural environment sounds. And they literally were at Gombe and had recorded all these different chimp sounds. Um, and we used, I think, the Cornell ornithology for some of the birds. We found other types of sound enrichment. Um, and then Brett, actually, when he went down to interview Jane, um, they spent some time shooting and getting some of their own sound. But at that point, he was three quarters of the way through, so I think he also knew some of the sounds he wanted. But for the most part, it was all music uh, sound libraries that um, were brought in and captured. And then after that, they had to have experts from, we had people from um, Jane Goodall Institute who were helping us to match the proper hoop pants with the proper expressions um, when they're angry and you know what was going, what the action was. And that was a huge part of it. Um, and then when the Philip Glass score was done, um, he went back in and actually edited it again so that the crescendos of the music match the crescendo of the movement of the, ch the chimps so that it all really worked to give the proper passion and uh, effect. I was also interested in the um, sort of the field journals and diary entries that we see, and they've sort of been animated mm -hmm. or sort of motion graphics. Were those also from the National Geographic Archive, or were they from the families? Those, those were all from the Jane Goodall Institute, and those were all scientific things that they had recorded. And um, he went through them and read them and found those very specific. One of the, you were talking about aha uh -huh, uh -huh moments for him, it was finding those telegrams, will you marry me? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, those were things that were discovered as we were pouring through. Um, her, the letter to mom, you know, mommy, what do you think? And she comes back about, well, you know, men don't really <laughs> care and all that. You know, th those were things that really were sort of discoveries that helped forward the story. And, um, but, and, and we, we didn't get hung up in a lot of the, the, the scientific part because it became less important. We spent huge amounts of time bringing it all in, but it, when, you, when you edit, you, you start taking out what is extraneous and get to the core of the story. Mm -hmm. um, I just have one more question, and then I think we'll open it up to the audience. Um, sort of relating back to the idea of film preservation, um, obviously all of this, this footage was shot on film and it was preserved on film. We're moving into a more digital era and I've heard it called capture culture, the idea that every day we're taking endless amounts of photos um, and institutions are moving towards digital workflows. Um, what is your perspective on, I guess, the different formats we're using, ideas about preservation in the future? Obviously this footage had been shot on beta cam or some other type of digital or analog um, format. It would have been maybe harder pr to preserve yeah, um, it's nothing like film. <laughs> um, it it holds it. it it's a hundred years old and it still looks great if it's preserved um, well. Um, I I fear for the digital future because we don't know. I mean, we all thought, oh, pneumatic and Betacam, and you know, every ten years there's something else that gets discovered and in the archival world sort of needs to be, to re-migrate um, into newer forms. And we just don't know, I think it, it's, there's so much being produced now, um, it's hard to preserve it all. There's so much of our past that is not yet digitized or preserved properly. There's so much in archives that hasn't been touched. It's not online, not everything is online. That's the, I think that's any archivist or, or archive researcher person will say that. Um, never think it's all online. Mm -hmm. um, and we shoot so much more. It's so cheap. Everyone's got their phone, and, and there's just reams and hours and millions of hours. The news organizations can't even keep up with storing everything that they shoot. They shoot hundreds and hundreds of hours a day, and they have to start deciding what they're going to let loose. So I, how we preserve, I don't know, you know, it's all, as I was saying, ones and zeros, you know, and how is that to be preserved and saved? I don't know. It's a little frightening. Um, 
Well, let's open it up uh, to the audience for some questions. Uh, and we do have some volunteers with mics, I believe. Uh, so just raise your hand and let them know, and they'll run over to you with the mic. If there's anyone interested. It is not on. Thanks. Hi. Or yes. That about three quarters of the way in. Um, she had nothing to do with the film. She was like, initially she, s she said, I've had so many films done. I am so not wanting another film. And she was sort of pushed into it by National Geographic. She thought that was stupid. It was just another stupid film, as she said. And um, when Brett went down to Gombe, he insisted that he wanted to go in the natural environment to interview her for three and a half hours. And um, the questions that he asked were so riveting. They, it was the most intelligent, she said, ever of any of the films. They became immediate friends. And the interview lasted three and a half days. Um, she never saw the film till it was completed and was totally moved by it because it brought back some th the emotion and captured things she had hidden away years before. So she was a huge proponent and came out and actually um, did a lot of press with him. But um, the only reason he really brought her on camera was just to fill in some things that he thought were essential to carry the story that she hadn't really told. Okay, it works now, great. Um, uh, I wanted to ask uh, whether... Uh, by some archive person and, and thought it was worthy of of another look-see because it was untouched. Um, and they, National Geographic was relaunching their Explorer series and they wanted to kick it off in a really big way. They've never done a film quite this big. Um, it, it got enormous press. Um, it premiered at the Hollywood Bowl in LA. It was just, it was crazy. Um, so they put a huge effort behind it and it was really they who pushed it. They presented it, they, they wanted a big director, they got Brett, um, he was excited about it, he saw an opportunity, so um, for him, um, he jumped at it, uh, and, and it was, but it was, and we got lots of other footage. I mean, we went through, it wasn't only National Geographic, there's lots of other sources in there, but the bulk of it um, was all from that from Nat Geo or, or things that, that he shot, that Hugo shot, basically, um, except for the interviews, really, and a couple of small pieces that of other material we used. I'd also be interested, I'm just jumping in quickly, I'm super curious about this Orson Welles narrated <laughs> film that would basically be the same footage, it, the, it's the original footage, the right. footage that was chosen, I guess, for that first. Brett what made a it? decision, he didn't want to use any of what was used. Okay. So he, he we didn't use anything from the film, mm. and it was completely from the outtakes. Mm. So. Yeah. Um, <coughs> in the credits, there. Because he came with like 30 people. He had this ridiculous <laughs> crew of people that went down, and she was like, ah, I guess this is a real thing. It's not just some fly by night production. So they, they that's what she's credited for. And I think they did a couple little other shoots, but of, but for the most part, uh, hundred, almost 100% 100 of that is all um, archive footage of Hugo's. Any other questions? We have a lot of, um, there are a lot of. Uh, <laughs> um, I have a film degree. I went to NY Film School. I um, had a, worked in production for a while. Uh, I was really fortunate to end up working with um, some filmmakers who were archival filmmakers. 
um, out of the David Wolper group and discovered by accident, this is a, this is a thing. So it was really exciting. Um, I love the whole challenge of finding footage. I mean, one of the earliest films I did was on Paul Robeson, and I, I, had, I was very young, and I, I had to go to Poland. I mean, not go to Poland, but I, I had to call the Poland University and libraries, and I found out you can actually do that, and you can, you can go elsewhere and, and find things. So it was exciting, and then it also became part of a lifestyle choice. Um, production's tough. <laughs> you gotta get up early, you know? It's hard to have a family, and I, I made a choice, and this is incredibly creative for me, and I also could be a mom, and I could do all sorts of, make my own time. Um, we work very hard, but, you know, so that was part of my decision and the way I chose to go forward. Getting into it, um, you in Canada have an amazing organization, and I know there's some people out here, and I'm going to say it wrong, Visual Research Society of Canada, or Visual Society of Re VSRC. I said it right? The yes. VR, I always get it wrong. Um, but they are an organization of researchers, um, and there's two incredible women here from there, and... Um, Certainly, if someone's interested, that's, I think, a good place to start. And they have training sessions, I believe, right? So um, there's lots of, lots of ways to locally to get involved and learn more. I noticed there was, in the credits, uh, a eph ephemera collector. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? What was that role? In ter was that someone that assisted that you, or is that a different? Ephemera collector? Or something like that. It went by so fast. <laughs> it was, I thought maybe it was some sort of archival type of role. Well, we, 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 we refer to ephemera as the sort of the, the, the flat art, I guess. It's, um, it's the notebooks. Like the, the, the press clippings and the those types of things? Right. We said other, oh, I see, I remember. The credit was other um, materials and ephemera, courtesy of. And we listed all the newspaper clippings. Yeah, it's 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 another way to say not photos, not footage. <laughs> it's ephemera. Yeah. So, any other questions? Do we have time for one more? <laughs> Brett's from the very beginning. The question was, whose idea was it to choose Philip Glass to score the film? It was before. That he just saw that immediately, and um, so f he was. We actually had to wait for Philip to become available, um, and also delayed the film a little bit in coming out. But um, yeah, he always wanted him. Okay, great. I think that's it. Thank you so much for coming and spending the evening with Thank us. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica.